Hi everyone, Kyle here with PS Platypus, and today we're going to go through some GIT infections. Alright, so some key ideas. Generally, uh, you're going to be getting a GIT infection via the fecal oral route, so feces uh, or a component of feces uh, making its way orally, and then that'll result in a few different pathologies. So, invasion of the gut tissue, um, systemic illness or systemic disease, or the production of locally acting, acting toxins like you might see in food poisoning. A brief note on history, it's really important to actually figure out what the potential pathogens, sorry, what the potential pathogens may be. Um, so looking at how long the symptoms have lasted for, wh whether the person's been traveling recently, what they've been exposed to, so food, other people, um, certain animal reservoirs potentially, um, whether they've been immunosuppressed, so whether they have, uh, whether they're immunocompromised, or they're on immunosuppressants or something, um, and other medications that they might be on. All right, so just some brief definitions. Uh, gastroenteritis it generally presents with these uh, key GIT symptoms. So nausea, nausea uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and discomfort in the abdomen. Um, gastroenteritis, it means like stomach and enter, entero, or enter means like inside, but here we're really talking about the intestines. Um, and itis is infectional inflammation, right? But here we're talking about infection. Then we have uh, diarrhea. So diarrhea is frequent and or liquid stools, um, and that's usually due to enterotoxins, so toxins produced by bacteria, and usually uh, happening in the small intestine causes that. And com let's uh, compare that to dysentery, which is an inflammatory gastrointestinal disorder. Um, and some more alarming findings, so uh, blood and pus in the feces, um, and that'll present with similar findings, so, uh, but also on top of that sort of diarrhea plus blood and pus in the feces, it'll also have pain, fever, and abdominal cramps. And in contrast to diarrhea, that's usually due to invasive infection, so invasion of the gut tissue or the GIT tissue, and actually destruction of that mucosa, that surface lining, um, the epithelium, in the large intestine especially. Sorry, my slide's seem to be jumping around a little bit. Uh, and then generally with treatment of diarrhea, it's usually mostly supportive, so rest and making sure that they aren't really dehydrated or have too much fluid. <laughs> really, I guess, with diarrhea, it's making sure they have enough fluid, because um, there's a lot of fluid loss via um, the frequent liquid stores. So uh, that means that most of the time we're not giving antibiotics. If it's a viral cause, then obviously that's not going to do anything. Um, and unless really it's bacterial and specifically invasive or enteric or typhoid fever that we suspect, um, then we're not going to give antibiotics. We are going to give antibiotics if it's invasive, enteric fever, um, invasive or enteric fever, or if uh, you're infected with Vibrio cholera. Um, and that's because we need to stop the toxins and the really, really intense fluid loss um, that you get with that. All right, so there are many different types of organisms that can infect the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and those include viruses, bacteria, protozoa, um, and helminths. The most common GIT infections, and really what's going to dictate the, the rest of this discussion aside from some buzzwords that I'll show you in the next few slides. Um, they're uh, diarrhea and dysentery, both from bacteria, um, typhoid fever, diarrhea after you've had antibiotics and sort of cleared out um, the normal flora of the gastrointestinal tract, food poisoning, so that's due to those uh, toxins that I was talking about, uh, specifically the pathogen Helicobacter pylori, um, and that's because it, it's the most common cause of peptic ulcers and can also increase your risk of stomach cancer. Um, and vi viral gastroenteritis, or viral gastro. Um, yeah. All right. And we've got a bunch of pathogens that we'll talk through more a little bit later. Okay, so if we have a bit of a look at this summary here, it's just a nice table that I found um, on a revision lecture from last year. Um, and you can see it's just sort of breaking the clinical uh, presentation of stools um, and the 
problems, potentially of vomiting or fever, um, tenesmus, which is uh, like straining to have a bowel movement and uh, feeling like you haven't fully cleared your bowels. Um, the anatomic, like the typical location that you might see those problems occurring and the main pathogens that um, cause it, that cause those, those clinical presentations. All right, and now a beautiful uh, table of buzzwords from uh, the year that was um, Anki from last year. Sorry, the slides keep jumping around. Um, really, like, this is something to go and sort of memorize and maybe understand a little bit, but uh, just a few brief things to look at here. Um, you could think rice, rice is a cereal, bacillus cereus. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is a neurological uh, disorder, an autoimmune neurological disorder that can be caused by or, or sort of set off by an infection. Um, and that in includes by Campylobacter infection. Campylobacter pylori, I think, especially. Um, we've got amoebiasis, we've got traveler's diarrhea with that classic E. coli. Um, but we've got all of these sorts of buzzwords and they're very useful in Monash land because there's a bunch of questions, these sorts of stories that you'll see um, oh, a patient comes in, they've got, uh, they, they've, they've been eating a lot of soft cheese and uh, now they have a gut infection and that might be due to listeria. And that also has a risk for, for pregnant women uh, to the fetus um, or pregnant people to the fetus. Um, so that's why you can't have soft cheeses when you're pregnant because you might get uh, listeria and that can uh, have bad outcomes for the fetus. Um, and then a few, a few other things, and I'll talk a lot about, uh, or a bit about each of these pathogens, but yeah, just have a look at this, these buzzwords and get familiar with them because they're great for multiple choice questions. Uh, just a, a distinction here between food poisoning and foodborne illness. So food poisoning is due to those enterotoxins that we were talking about that are produced by bacteria, um, and it acts within hours. So the toxins, bacteria have been sort of replicating, producing toxins in the food that you're about to eat, um, and even if you cook the food afterwards and kill off the bacteria, the toxins still are present. So um, you still get sick and it, it happens quite quickly. And that's in com uh, contrast to foodborne illness, which is uh, infection that you've got from food contaminated by pathogens. So there are actual sort of living replicating pathogens um, and you've eaten food that contains it and then you've gotten an infection after that. That's the distinction between food poisoning and foodborne illness. All right, so moving on to sort of the breakdown that we're taking from here uh, and just having a look at each of these sorts of GIT infections. So bacterial diarrhea or dysentery, dysentery specifically being um, bloody diarrhea with the pus um, and the abdominal pain and the fever. So sort of more serious, uh, much more dangerous, I think. Um, although really, uh, diarrhea in general, um, and especially has a, a pretty high morbidity and mortality, uh, especially in developing countries due to the really substantial fluid loss. So it can, it can kill you if you're not replacing those, those fluids and electrolytes. All right, so we've got Salmonella non-typhi. So the, the uh, species of Salmonella that do not cause typhoid fever. So for instance, Salmonella enterica. Um, it's a gram-negative rod. Uh, you can see uh, contaminated chicken and eggs. Consumption of that uh, is how you, you might get it, the root of infection. Um, and it also has uh, animal reservoirs as c opposed to Salmonella typhi, which does not have animal reservoirs. Um, so animals that can sort of have the bacteria living in it and replicating and then passing it on to humans. Uh, then we've got Campylobacter jejuni, um, and that's once again sort of contaminated food, a gram-negative spiral, and can cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, which was that autoimmune neurological disorder uh, that is set off by infection. Uh, and the sort of uh, characteristic presentation of Guillain-Barre syndrome is bilateral, ascending weakness, muscle weakness. All right, then we've got Vibrio cholerae. Um, so that was that one that we do treat with antibiotics, right? Because it causes this enterotoxin and lots of fluid loss. Um, 
so you, you need to treat it with antibiotics, whereas the rest of these you usually wouldn't. Um, you just give fluids. Um, the buzzword here is rice water stools. If you see the word rice water stools, they have cholera. Um, and E. coli, classic uh, sort of fecal oral route uh, or contaminated food. Um, and we can actually get, uh, you can see I've color coded the organisms, the most common organisms to cause dysentery, um, are EIEC and Shigella um, here. Okay. Moving on. Looking at uh, typhoid fever, it's a systemic infection that starts in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, noting that diarrhea is also present, um, it could have gone in the last slide, I just didn't have space. Uh, and also, we just want to especially look at typhoid fever. Um, and so, because it's a systemic infection, we also have those systemic infective symptoms, so things like fever, um, malaria, discomfort, and aches. No animal reservoir, as I said earlier. Uh, it's spread from person to person, usually via contaminated food or water. So, um, someone will sort of contaminate the food or water, and then that will infect another person, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, rose spots are characteristic, but you only see it in about half of patients with typhoid fever. Uh, and then we've got sort of two main organisms, Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi, and those cause typhoid and paratyphoid fever. Um, and you can see that it's, it's very dangerous, right? Um, we, sepsis can be fatal, um, diarrhea can be fatal, and uh, fever as well, right? So very dangerous. Um, we diagnose via uh, culture, and that can be of a stool sample, a blood sample, or another body fluid or tissue, basically whatever you can get, I think. Um, but you need to start antibiotics as soon as you've diagnosed enteric fever. Um, and these are some examples of antibiotics that you can use. All right, antibiotic-associated diarrhea, really just one pathogen, Clostridium difficile, or also known as Clostridioides difficile, or C. diff. Um, it's a gram-positive rod. So Whereas the rest of these sort of bacterial diarrhea, uh, the, the diarrhea causing bacteria here, you can see they're all gram negative, right? Um, gram negative. But C. diff is gram positive. Uh, it causes watery diarrhea, but doesn't cause a fever. And really, it's an opportunistic infection post antibiotics. So you've uh, been on antibiotics for something else, some other infection potentially. And then, because of that, those antibiotics have killed off the normal flora, all of the non-harmful um, bacteria that usually inhabit your gastrointestinal tract. And so because of that, your C. diff um, starts to replicate and realizes that it can basically take over your gastrointestinal tract. Um, and so there are, I think, more than one treatment, but notably, like, you can do a fecal transplant um, where you take a sample of feces with R, like that normal flora, that no, that healthy, good, normal uh, GIT bacteria, and um, you have a tra you have a transplant. So I think you can take it as like tablets, um, or yeah, I think that's the main way. Basically, and then that way you have other bacteria that sort of take up space and uh, combat the C. diff, sort of taking up the entire GIT. All right, talking about food poisonings, remembering that that's those um, toxins, the enterotoxin caused uh, GIT infections uh, with the predominance of vomiting a lot of the time. So um, we have Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus, and Clostridium botulinum. So Staph aureus, very common, lives on our skin, lives everywhere, everything, very common uh, in the hospital as well. Um, and you can see all of these are sort of gram-positive, right? Um, and they generally result from poorly stored or poorly preserved foods. In uh, Staph aureus infection, you'll also get nausea and cramps in Bacillus cereus, especially diarrhea. Um, and with Clostridium botulinum, you get this massive laundry list of, of symptoms, um, but especially uh, descending muscle weakness, um, as well as these sorts of other ones, it's, it's due to this toxin and uh, yeah, botulism is, is very dangerous, so you have to treat it with an antitoxin. I think it's sort of, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it sort of causes a paralysis. 
All right. We're almost done. Good job sticking with me. Um, so, let's talk a bit about Helicobacter pylori. So this is a bacteria, a gram-negative rod, to be more specific, that thrives in an acidic environment. Um, and so, because it thrives in an acidic environment, it has an enzyme called urease that basically uh, stimulates hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid release. Um, and it does that by breaking down urea, right, into carbon dioxide and, uh-oh, someone in chemistry is going to correct me. It's either ammonia or ammonium, I think. Uh, but basically, carbon dioxide can then react with water and become carbonic acid. So it's um, acidic. So this urease enzyme is the way that we actually test for Helicobacter pylori. Um, we, we give urea, so we have them sort of swallow some carbon-14 urea, and then, uh, so that's a radioisotope, and then we, uh, sorry, then the, if Helicobacter pylori infection is present, then it'll have the urease that'll break it down, and then we can measure the carbon dioxide levels um, that are breathed back out, right, out of the lungs, because we breathe carbon dioxide out. And so that increase in carbon dioxide, especially with that radioisotope, I think, um, is then very diagnostic of helicobacter pylori infection. But sort of got ahead of myself there. It causes gastritis, so that's infection of the stomach. Um, it's actually the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease, PUD. And it also uh, is, it is not, the I don't think, the most common cause of stomach cancer. I'm not sure. But it increases your risk of uh, Malt lymphoma, but there should be a comma here. Uh, it causes stomach cancer. It doesn't. I don't know what, how how common it is. All right. And we're on the final slide. Thank goodness. So viral gastroenteritis. So gastro, you know, the the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, um, and the viral cause. Uh, colloquially, we might just refer to it as gastro. Really, we've got two viruses here. We've got rotavirus and norovirus. Rotavirus, we think kids. Norovirus, we think adults. So with, uh, they're both very infectious. You only need a few uh, actual pathogen particles, um, only a few virions to actually cause infection. Uh, so you can think in children, it'll probably be in uh, childcare or kindergarten that you'll sort of see it around because you're spreading it around lots of other kids. Um, and then with the norovirus, think like a cruise ship that sort of everyone's crammed on one ship, uh, relatively close quarters. And so they're all going to get infected. Uh, and you can see that these sorts of general systemic infective symptoms, um, spe specifically GIT stuff. So diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, but then also like fever is generally infective. All right, and really we want to treat them supportively. All right, thank you very much and uh, have a nice morning, day, afternoon, evening. <laughs>